Yes, we are live now on YouTube. Hello, sir. Uh, you can start now. Yeah, that's 3 p.m. on Tuesday, 21st of July, 2020. What a day to have. We have started this web series of uh, you know lectures uh, called uh, an, uh, an Hour with an Expert uh, under Atrimedex platform. And here we will be uh, introducing you various uh, you know specialists, real stalwarts in the field of uh, science, uh, different field of science. So kind of a translational kind of uh, uh, you know lecture series. Uh, today, uh, this is the first episode, and we have Dr. Narendra Chirmule, very popularly and lovingly called as Naren, uh, who was who is uh, joining us from Philadelphia, USA. Naren used to be in Bangalore uh, with Biocon earlier, and I will be giving an uh, uh, elaborate uh, uh, introduction about him uh, after a while. So, as a tradition, let's start this uh, particular session with the uh, invocation. So, over to Bharat. Thank you. 
So may I request uh, Dr. Sadat to give the welcome speech, please. Thank you, Dr. S. Family. Good afternoon. First of all, I warmly welcome all the delegates and eminent personalities attending this webinar from all around the world. This scientific lecture series, and now with an expert, is jointly organized by Ayurveda Medical Association of India, Adjumet Pharmaceuticals Private Limited, Ayurveda Vilasini Vaitishala. As the General Secretary of AMAI, I am very honored to be a part of this event. AMAI is the largest professional organization in the field of Ayurveda. More than 10,000 doctors are the part of this organization. The aim of our organization is the is to the propagation of Ayurveda and the welfare of the practitioners. AMAI conducts workshops, seminars, webinars, and other activities on various topics for the skill development of our members. We have a research foundation, which is engaged with various research activities. Also, we have a publication division to publish scientific books and journals. The program, and now with an expert, includes lectures by research renowned scientists on various subjects and researches related to COVID-19. Fortunately, today we have Dr. Narendra Chirubule here with us, who, who can speak authoritatively about the vaccine development. My privilege to welcome you, sir. I also extend a warm welcome to Dr. Shriban Genju, the Chairman, Attribute Pharmaceuticals Limited. I also, Dr. P.M. Varian, Chief Physician, Kota Kalari with Shala. I extend my hearty welcome to you, sir. I also extend a cordial welcome to Dr. Manoj Kalu, former CCM member and Managing Director, AVBVS, and Dr. Rishikesh Damle, Managing Director, Attribute Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Raju Thomas, the President, AMAI, Dr. B.G. Uday Gomar, Chairman, Research Foundation, AMAI, Dr. Shaiju, the Scientific Committee, AMAI, Dr. Leda Lamle. Once again, I welcome all the delegates, all eminent personalities attending this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I now uh, request Dr. Lata Damle to introduce Dr. Shiban Ganju. He will give some opening notes and uh, he will talk about a few minutes about uh, you know the, this program as well as vaccines. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Please go on. Okay. Hello, everyone. Here I am pri feeling privileged to introduce our beloved Dr. Shiban Ganju, who is the founder and chairman of Atomet Pharmaceuticals. Graduating from Ames, Delhi, and being certified by the American Board of Inter Internal Medicine and Gastroenterology, his clinical service has spanned over many years in India and the USA in various disciplines, including tertiary clinical care, public health and healthcare business. He worked as consultant at the University of Chicago, Ingalls Hospital and Advocate Healthcare, Illinois. Formerly, he has been the CEO of Reliance Health and Technology, director of Prakriya Hospitals, advisor to Innovative Curious Inc. and many other organizations. He was also the founder of Indo-American Medical Association at Illinois. Besides participating in policymaking and think tanks, he has also served in the Indian Army. His association with public health and keen interest to uplift the unmet needs of 
the lesser privileged made him start a healthcare NGO called Save a Mother, which has worked in 1,500 Indian villages since 2008 and is striving hard to improve maternal health and reduce maternal and infant mortality. He has also published his articles in Mail Today, Three Quirks Daily, The Seminar, amongst others. I hereby request Dr. Shibanji to make his opening remarks on the vaccines, thus starting today's session. Thank you, one and all. Dr. Thank, Doctor, thank you, Dr. Lataji. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'll just take two or three minutes before Dr. our main speaker, Dr. Chirumuli, comes in. As Dr. Damle, right in the beginning of this seminar, said that this is a series that, uh, with the help of all of you, we'll be conducting over the next few months a serious seminars to bring all of us at par in various fields through the voice of experts, and we'll all learn from the experts uh, what's the latest and the best uh, on that particular topic on that day. Uh, hopefully, next six months or so, we'll all be educated. If this is acceptable to all and is favorable, we may continue it even beyond six months. Now, today's topic, of course, Dr. Chirmali will talk in detail about it. I just want to bring up to Par with just two or three comments. Uh, one, a vaccination is the ultimate immune modulator. We talk about immune mod modulators all the time these days in the news, uh, more of a marketing gimmick than as a science. And an immune modulator is one that can influence either uh, B cells, B lymphocytes, or T lymphocytes. That's the ultimate function. And short of that, nothing else, the immune modulator, we use it as a marketing gimmick. And most of the immune modulator industry is um, unscientific and unvalidated. Now, vaccination started um, almost 200 years ago, 1798 to be exact, by a person you must have heard in, the, your, in your own um, education systems, a fellow called Edward Jenner, who injected cowpox into a small boy and protected him with smallpox. Since then, we have um, learned more about vaccines and how to develop them. And currently, we have close to uh, vaccines close to 30 causative agents. We routinely vaccinate people uh, for about 18 diseases all the time with multiple uh, vaccinating agents made by different companies. Uh, if one were to list most important five advances in healthcare or public health in the past century, um, Vaccination will be on the top. Uh, we have been able to reduce mortality um, on infants and children from close from 20% zero. And my guess is vaccination along with um, sanitation and nutrition has, has added 20 years to our life expectancy in the last one century. In the last 100 years, we have added more because just three simple things then we, we have added with all tertiary care put together. Um, since vaccination is so successful, most of the nations have adopted national policies. We in India adopted a universal immunization program in 1985. Our tragedy is we've been able to vaccinate only 60 to 70 percent of our population uh, because of uh, the lack is because of distribution problems, uh, lack of health workers, and behavior change, reluctance to get vaccinated among the population, which is what our task should be next. Dr. Chirumuli and company will produce vaccines and the rest of us, we must motivate our clients, our patients, our friends and families to get vaccinated so we become all disease free. Um, with that, I will hand over to our uh, mod moderator and Dr. Damle to carry it forwards. Thank you all for coming and Hope we'll get you again in future seminars also. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shiban. But we couldn't see you because you have not switched on your uh, video. Can you just switch on your video? My video is on. Uh, I think he is not. Uh, Bharat is controlling it too. My video is on. was on throughout. 
सर बिकॉज ऑफ लो बैंडविथ वी के नॉट सी यूर वीडियो सर so let's let's move forward uh, so uh, let me take the privilege of introducing dr chirmule there's a small sanskrit shloka which says that uh, um, nabhisheko na samskara kriya, uh, simhasya kriyate mraga uh, vikramarjita rajasya swayam eva mragendrata basically means there is no coronation there is no uh, function to call uh, you know uh, a lion as a king of uh, for us because of his uh, grace and uh, his power he is a uh, king of the forest similarly i don't i will give introduction about dr chirmule but i don't need to give introduction i mean uh, uh, to tell you about his cv at the end of this lecture because with his grace and with his uh, uh, knowledge and the clarity in his knowledge as well as simplistic personality you will accept him as a king of vaccines so but anyway i will do my bit because this is part of the uh, process so dr chimule did his bs and ms and phd from mumbai university where he won few awards there are four awards i can list here which he has won during his student days a bright student then he did a post doctoral fellowship at cornell university in new york he joined cornell university as associate director in 87 and served there till 96 in clinical immunology laboratory he he worked from 96 to 2000 at the university of uh, pennsylvania that's in philadelphia actually he is joining us from philadelphia right now he is there then he is worked in merck uh, director of vaccine and biological research it will be very of your interest here to know that gardasil which is a virus i mean a vaccine for hpv virus rotatec that is a vaccine for rota virus and zostavax that's varicella virus etc he has worked on these viruses and that's the very reason why we called him because he is a, he knows the inside story which he is going to st- uh, share with us about uh, making vaccines how long does it take how many steps does it take how many times they fail and what kind of surprises you are likely to encounter when you are developing vaccines later he worked for amgen from 2007 to 2014 as a director of clinical immunology and immunology and vaccine are you know related then he was at biocon india from 2015 to 2019 in between he was a, a professor in for a short period at uh, university in german germany right now he is an entrepreneur he has started his own company called symphony tech biologicals which is um, uh, facilitating co- other companies to make drug development easier and he they also facilitate uh, through technology rather merging biology and technology and uh, they also they also have systems in place for manufacturing uh, uh, products so he has won several awards including uh, as i said in mumbai he has won uh, a couple of awards in mumbai he was working with merck and amgen again he is he is a cipla fellow uh, you know this award was given to him last year now he is a member at uh, uh, for stem cell research committee he is associate biotechnology lead enterprise of india he is a part of society for immunology immunotherapy in tours he is a member and board of um, gabrini college biotechnology program etc the list is little long uh, he is a reviewer for uh, you know study section uh, of hiv vaccines uh, interestingly he was in editorial board of vaccine and nature medicine which is familiar with you gene therapy human gene therapy etc and journal of immunology aids research and immune in uh, retrovirus in blood so he has several patents to his list it's very huge and uh, probably he i can see that he has around uh, oh the list is very 114 um, publications which he has listed here i am sure he has more with this introduction i would welcome dr narendra chirmule for this session we will all be enjoying his lecture welcome you sir and the stage is for you thank you very much oh, thank you so much um and thank you so much for inviting me to um, share my thoughts about the vaccine uh, and uh, rishikesh um, very very kind uh, introduction i um, appreciate uh, the effort that is everyone has taken to make this happen um so i'll jump straight into my talk um i um i've been reading about covid like all of us have been in the last 6 months um and and i think it's very very interesting to see how this new virus 
uh, has resulted in, a, in an explosion of science in, um, in in the community. Like everybody is interested in science. It's really transformed the way people think about science now. Uh, I've just summarized the questions that we've tried to answer in the last six months uh, as, a, as a community. So why do people, we still don't have answers to these. Why do people respond so differently? What is the nature of immunity and how long does it last? Has the virus developed any worrying mutations? How well will the vaccine work? What is the origin of the virus? What steps can we take to get back to normal? And what lessons can we ensure that the next pandemic will be averted? I'll address some of those questions, specifically the vaccine one. Uh, I'll talk about these four topics, immunopathogenesis, uh, viral entry, the vaccine design, and the recent clinical up updates as, as late as yesterday. Uh, from a pathogenesis perspective, uh, I think one point that I'm sure uh, many of you already know this, but I'm going to uh, reiterate it because it's relevant to the vaccine, is that the pathogenesis of this virus, which means the way the virus causes a disease is twofold. One is that the virus enters through the nasopharyngeal tract. It enters through the what is called the ACE receptor on these cells. It kills the cell, which means it's cytopathic. In doing so, it causes a huge inflammatory response of the immune, immune system. And this is called a cytokine storm. And that's why uh, the pathogenesis is both by the virus, but also by the immune system itself. And it affects many, many organs of the tissue. And the final uh, uh, fatal stages of the disease are because of this multi-organ failure. A little bit about the immuno a basic immunology before we get into vaccines. There are three kinds of immunity that we need to focus on. One is called the innate immunity. Second is adaptive immunity. And third is mucosal immunity. In innate immunity, what happens, this is a very old, uh, old meaning evolutionarily very old uh, immune system, which is present even in single, single cellular organisms like amoeba and also drosophila and every, or every uh, evolutionary, this pathway of signaling is involved uh, in the innate immune response. So for example, you have toll-like receptors, which transmit signals into the cells. It activates genes. These genes, such as interferons, have multiple functions, and this is how the innate immune response is the first layer of the immune response. Then we have what is called the adaptive immune response, which is the immune system adapts to the uh, invading virus. So in this situation, the virus enters the cell through an antigen-presenting cell, and uh, this virus is presented to either MHC class 1 molecule, which activates CD4 positive cells, or it presents antigen through MHC class 1 and activates CD8 positive cells. <clears throat> the CD4 positive cells helps B cells make antibodies, and it also helps CD8 cells differentiate into killer cells. <clears throat> the reason I'm telling you this at this level of detail is because the vaccine uh, if you replace this virus to the vaccine, the vaccine, should, a successful vaccine for this um, virus needs to activate both the B cell response as well as the cytotoxic T cell response, which is known as humoral immunity, which is the ability of the body to secrete antibodies, which can then clear the virus, which is outside the cells. They're called extracellular virus. And if the virus is inside the cells, like inside our lung tissue or it is present in the cell, it needs to be killed by the, by the cytotoxic T cell, and that is called cell-mediated immunity. Antibodies, which have a structure like a Y, uh, are neutralizing antibodies, which bind to the virus and block virus from entering the cell. Cell-mediated immunity, the cytotoxic T cells that I mentioned, actually recognize the virally infected cells and inject uh, toxic materials into the cell and kill the cell. So this is the CD8 T cell killing a virally infected cell. So both arms of the immune system are very important. In addition, we have an immune system called the mucosal immunity, 
where we have a lot of immune, it is the immune system that is exposed to the ex, uh, outside environment directly, like the nasal cavity, the gut, the genital tract. The immune system that is present in these tissues is, a, is evolved slightly differently. And so we have to pay attention to these, especially you can imagine for COVID, we need to have a very strong immune response in our mouth and nose so that the virus doesn't enter the cell, uh, doesn't enter the body easily through that portion. And we'll come to that. And there are a lot of immunology basic questions that people are asking to determine what is the immune signature for disease progression. So it's a very complex interaction of all these cells that is happening. And, uh, and a lot of people are trying to find out the immunological reasons of why people progress to disease and why people don't. A few words about the virus. Uh, it is, it is a, a RNA virus, meaning the, the genome is RNA. It has these proteins, spike, envelope, hemagglutinin, uh, membrane and nucleocapsid, which are called structural proteins. The, the, the spike protein is one of the proteins that seems to be the most important in terms of entry. So this is what the spike protein looks like on the surface of the virus. Uh, it has this ring-like structure on top and it has a stalk. Um, now that stalk looks like this. The top portion is called S1 of the spike protein. The bottom portion is called S2. And this TM is the transmembrane domain, and it has these other, it has a site called the proteolytic cleavage site. Mm. This site needs to be cleaved for the virus to enter, and I'll show you that in the next slide. There are several steps that the virus takes to enter the cell. The spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor, shown here in blue. Then the spike protein is cleaved. You can see the virus is cleaved. The virus fuses with the cell membrane and enters the cell through another, another pathway. So let me play that again, because this is very important for developing a neutralizing antibody. So the virus binds to the spike protein. So your antibody against the, um, that you need to generate needs to be against the, against the red portion of the spike where you can block binding but you also need to have an antibody that binds to this portion of the uh, spike protein so that you can block fusion. So there are two steps. So making a neutralizing antibody against this virus is not easy. And the reason I say this is because there's a lot of experience that we've got from other viruses like the influenza virus, HIV, all use this dual pathway of entering. Um, so, and we know how difficult it is to make antibodies against influenza and HIV. It's very difficult. We don't have a vaccine for either of them yet. Um, so um, this is what the spike protein looks like. It appears from in vitro assays that if you have an antibody that blocks this uh, entry portion, you are able to block neutralizing antibodies. So it is suggestive that the vaccine might work. Let's see. We'll see how it works. Now the immune response, I like to draw, I like to draw. So you know, when I when I draw, I th things become much more clearer to me. So I would really recommend <laughs> I, uh, people to draw out their thoughts. Uh, thoughts become so much clearer. Uh, that's why I don't, I make PowerPoint slides, but I stick in my own pictures in them too. So this is the timeline of how the virus uh, infects people. We know that we've once you get infected on the left side, mm, there is a period of time uh, which ranges between four to seven days where, where the virus is replicating inside the body that is shown in this purple graph. Um, but the patients are asymptomatic. At some point when the viral load reaches a threshold, these symptoms start emerging. These symptoms will peak at seven to 14 days and then uh, in a healthy person be cleared by 30 days. In the, in the meanwhile, you have an antibody response, first primarily IgM response, an IgG response, and a T cell response. And the goal of the vaccine is to develop a strong IgG response as well as a T cell response. And the, and the line I've drawn here is some kind of a threshold uh, over which you have to have protective levels. Now let's think about the vaccine. Um, 
what is the nature of the protective immune response? Do you need both humoral and cell mediated immunity? What part of the virus can induce this immune response? What kind of vaccine do we need? Dose, frequency, how much vaccine do we have to make? All of these questions need to be answered. In drug development, to make it systematic, uh, we use a term called target product profile. This is the requirement of what the vaccine should do. So this is a, a, um, the first, what, first part of the developing a vaccine. The goal of the vaccine is twofold. One, it should prevent infection. But if it doesn't prevent infection, at least it should stop replication of the virus inside the cell. Second, who are the people who will get it? Uh, of course, everybody needs to get it, but the first people who will get it are the healthcare workers who are providing uh, assistance to, doc to other patients, susceptible individuals like people with comorbid diseases, and then healthy contacts of people who are coming in contact with the infected people. And then the larger population will get it. So if you consider this group of people, you already have 10 to 100 million doses that you will have to make notwithstanding if the entire world needs to make it, you need 7 billion. But manage it in a, from a planning perspective, 10 to 100 million is a good start. The measures of efficacy, I measure, I told you, you need to have a humoral immune response as well as a cell-mediated immune response. So you need to induce neutralizing antibodies and you need to induce cytotoxic T cells. The dose that will be required, if it is a virus-like particle or if, if they are like viral vectors, etc., generally the range of, of the vaccine dose can be around 10 to the 10th particles. If it's a protein, like a spike protein or an envelope protein, etc., the range is around 20, 20 to 100 micrograms. And this dose, I'm telling you, based on previous vaccines that have been approved. Uh, the durability, it should be durable at least for a year, if not more. Uh, and the product should be stable. So the formulation that you're putting in the vaccine in should be transportable to remote areas of different parts of the world. Uh, the process of developing vaccines uh, in, is a multi-step systematic process where um, first you have to identify which part of the virus you should make a vaccine against. And this timeline has been really shortened for this vaccine because the world has collaborated with each other. So somebody in China is collaborating with somebody in England, with India, with US, with Australia, with New Zealand. So all the people are working together and publishing papers so fast and so quickly uh, and sharing their knowledge that this time of identification of the antigen, which usually takes decades sometimes, has happened in literally days and months. Um, so there's a lot of evidence suggesting that this, and if you make a vaccine against spike, at least you will have some level of protection. Now the spike protein can be expressed by different ways. You can have it in an RNA, DNA protein, it can be in a viral vector, inactivated or live viral, back, uh, live attenuated. Then one must develop a process to make the vaccine. Uh, do animal toxicology studies and clinical trials, and then finally get approval. Then the major challenge is scale up and distribution, which happens uh, during the later stage of the vaccine. So normally a, a process which takes about 10 years uh, is being done in less than two years because of this immense collaboration, uh, which is a very good sign for science in general in the world. Uh, so um, these are just timelines of when things were available. There are uh, at least 139 preclinical candidates and 21 uh, clinical candidates as of yesterday in, uh, in the WHO website. I'm going to talk about majorly about this Oxford chimp adenovirus vaccine trial, uh, um, not because I believe that it is the only vaccine which works, but I wanted to use it as an example of to show how the development of the vaccine uh, proceeds. So let's look at that um, chip adenovirus vaccine. So what is the vaccine? So first you have to identify the antigen. So we said it was spike. Now the spike protein, which is shown here in this uh, cartoon of this gene, uh, is the gene uh, of this, the DNA of this spike protein is inserted 
into the DNA of this adenovirus and the space is made by removing some portion of the viral protein. So now you make an adam, ad, what is called an adenoviral vector. Uh, so where the, it is where the adenovirus deleted gene is replaced by the spike protein. And uh, the Oxford group has used this kind of approach for making adenoviral vectors for other diseases uh, and they've got some experience in humans um, before, suggesting it's a safe vaccine. And they've been able to show that induces both humoral and cell-mediated immunity. Um, last month, they published the data from the preclinical study from vaccination of, uh, of these monkeys. Um, rhesus monkeys were either vaccinated with COVID vaccine or with the control vector, which is the green fluorescent protein uh, control. They were given intramuscular injections, immune responses were measured, and 28 days after the vaccination, all the animals were challenged with a live virus through the intranasal route. So when you look at the data from that paper, uh, you can see on the left side is the, the virus neutralizing antibody titer, and the right side is spot forming units, which is a measure of T cell function, cytotoxic T cell function. And the red dots are the vaccinated animals and the blue dots are the control animals. And in general, you can see that um, all the vaccinated animals have a larger uh, virus neutralizing antibody response and the blue dots don't. And similarly, some or not all of the, um, of the animals have a, have a T cell response compared to the control animals. Uh, so this vaccine was successful in monkeys, and let's see what happens. Uh, now, before I go to show you the challenge, how the challenge was done with the live viral vaccine, I need to explain to you a little bit about the mucosal immune response that I mentioned. Uh, we have our um, the mucosal cavity, which is um, the nasopharynx, the oral pharynx, uh, and the top portion is called the upper respiratory tract. And the lung and the bronchus and all this is called the lower respiratory tract. So I've drawn a red line between them. To measure the upper respiratory tract, the, the group took nasal swabs. And to measure the immune response in the lower respiratory tract, they took bronchial alveolar lavage, which is they put a tube through the lung and took a sample from inside the lung. And now let's look at the results. This is a busy slide, so I'm going to show it to you piece by piece. Let's look at the piece within the box. Uh, so now this is the result of the virus, which is present. Um, this is the look, they are measuring the virus, uh, COVID-2 virus, in the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated or, or the control vaccinated monkeys. The red dots again are the vaccinated group. You can see in the bowel fluid, which is the lower respiratory tract, the amount of virus is quite low, right? And in the in the control animals who didn't get the vaccine, you have a lot of virus in the in the lung. Okay, um, you can see here. Uh, there's another interesting thing. But if you take the nasal swab from these monkeys, you can see there's no difference between the between the red and blue dots, which means the vaccine did not protect, uh, did not induce an immune response strong enough to have a high neutralizing response in the upper respiratory tract because it was given intramuscularly. And, and on the left side, A, you, this is just measuring the clinical score. You can see that the vaccinated monkeys did get infected, but they cleared the virus a little bit better than the non than the control monkeys. So this vaccine does, is not, does not induce sterilizing immunity, but it does end pneumonia. That's what the summary of this data shows. Now, the clinical trial has started and they just reported the, the first uh, phase of the clinical trial uh, uh, this week. Um, the design of the trial was 18 to 55 year old people and healthy, healthy people, but a thousand odd subjects given this five times 10 to the 10th particles. And they were given a control vaccine. Volunteers are blinded so that they don't know whether they got the COVID vaccine or the control vaccine, which is a meningococcal vaccine. And after a predetermined number of individual infection, the study will be unblinded later. And the trial is still ongoing. And this is results that they published in Lancet uh, two days ago. 
uh, this is they showed the safety and immunogenicity of the Chadox vaccine uh, in SARS-CoV-2, a preliminary report. Uh, and if you can just look at the antibody response, which is the reciprocal endpoint titer to spike protein, and look at three doses, 2500 and 250, you can see that they actually did, did induce an immune response. Uh, so these are just a little bit more detail about the antibody response that they generated. They generated spike anti-spike IgG, they developed neutralizing antibodies, and they also developed T-cell response. So the Chadox vaccine induced, showed an acceptable safety profile and homologous boosting response to the antibody response. This is very encouraging. Um, the mRNA vaccine, which has also been done by Moderna, uh, also, result, also reported their results this week. And this is a lipid nanoparticle encapsulated mRNA to spike protein. They chose 45 healthy subjects they also saw a fairly decent antibody response. I apologize, I mixed up the figures in the Chadoff vaccine. They look like the same figure, but I, have to, I will correct it in my future slides. So both the vaccine have shown promising results, and uh, it is exciting to see that they both induce neutralizing antibody as T-cell responses. And I will show you in the next slide what the possible results can be. Meanwhile, both all the companies are trying to develop the MAC vaccine in a large scale manufacturing so that um, it will be available for distribution once it's ready. So now let's look at the possible results. What could happen? These are not real results. These are hypothetical results that I'm projecting that could happen. We could anticipate how the vaccine could work. So remember, I told you that there were in the design of the vaccine, there is the vaccinated group and there is the placebo group, which is the control group, right? Uh, in this case, COVID vaccinated group and meningococcal vaccinated group. And they're all blinded. Nobody knows who got what. After the unblinding is finished, let's say 100 people got infected. Now we have to find out where those 100 people landed. If all of them landed or if all of them were in the meningococcal group, then your efficacy of your drug, of your efficacy of your vaccine would be 100%. If only 80%, uh, and 80% in the, if were in this meningococcal group, then you would have 80% efficacy, et cetera. If the number of infected people was same in the control and the vaccinated group, then the vaccine failed, didn't work, right? But there's one more option that has happened with other viruses. That's why we are projecting it. There may be more people who get the, who, who uh, vaccinated with COVID who might get, who might make him susceptible to COVID than the control group, which means the vaccine could actually make it dangerous. So why I'm, why I'm stating this is not because I, I, because something like this has happened in the past, especially with dengue as recent as a couple of years ago. So this is an anticipated result that we should be prepared uh, and observe very closely as we develop these vaccines. So finally, uh, for, uh, the success of a vaccine will require efficacy and safety that I mentioned. Uh, but in addition, there will be economic, social, political aspects of this vaccine, which, uh, which I'm sure many of you have a lot of questions about. Ultimate goal of vaccine is to, prevent, is to have herd immunity, where and herd immunity is described by, the, by enough number of people who either have, been, either have antibody through vaccination or through previous infections, that will prevent uh, spread of this virus. Uh, so what are the lessons we have learned from previous vaccines? These are my last slides. Um, the virus, all viruses have adapted to the immune response very differently. Mutations occur due to high immune pressure. Induction of neutralizing antibodies requires several components of the immune system, not just neutralizing antibodies. Um, and several factors are involved in the vaccine-induced response, which include product-related components, host health, immunological and genetic conditions of the patients to respond to this vaccine. So finally, in uh, what I summarize with, there's an explosion of science in the community. This is very, very good for the science. Um, and uh, I will stop here and uh, I would be happy to take more questions and uh, have a discussion. Thank you so much. And share. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so now, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That was very enlightening, uh, brief, uh, but uh, you know, precise. So now I will um, uh, request Dr. Shiban Ganju to uh, come in. Uh, can you please uh, uh, on your video, sir? Am I there now? Uh, we can hear you, but we can't see you. I can see my face. <laughs> Bharat, see what's the matter? I can see it. I was, I'm on my, I'm, I'm on the video now. Yeah, uh, sir. Actually, uh, the bandwidth is very low at your end, so okay, I is unable to process your video, sir. It's okay. So your bandwidth is very low. Okay, that's because I'm the capital of India, so that's why. <laughs> yes, sir. So now I would like you to you know comment on uh, you know Dr. Uh, uh, Chirumale's uh, speech, and maybe you have some questions to ask. The, Dr. Chirumali, it was excellent presentation, uh, really to the point and succinct and very clear. I have only one question. How is mucosal immunity mediated? Is it through T cells, B cells or both? So, you know, both. Uh, and, and one of the aspects of mucosal immunity is induction of a of a IgA response. Correct. IgA is a is a is a type of immunoglobulin that is predominantly present in the in the mucosal tissue, and and the induction of IgA from a vaccinology perspective is not easy because to induce IgA you need you need to force the B cell to undergo what is called somatic mutation in multiple steps. So the so the art of inducing IgA is not mastered by vaccinologists yet. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Dominic. Hello. Uh, did uh, Shaiju, did you raise your hand? Uh, we can't hear him. Uh, Bharat, can you unmute uh, Shaiju? Yeah, it's done, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank it was a really a brainstorming session. But I have one question just to get it clarified from you. Under which uh, which which circumstances now this COVID nineteen may get an uh, an easy mutations because it is very important in the process of these vaccinations. The chance of mutations. What are the possibilities under uh, such situations it may get easily mutated? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, one um, I, I have a. I'll answer the question in different layers. One is, uh, what is the probability that this vac this virus will undergo mutations where it will evade the immune response induced by these vaccines? Uh, and to answer that question, I'll use the support of evolution of this virus. Um, and what I've been reading, and I think um, I, I won't say I'm an expert in this area, but um, Coronaviruses mutate less than other viruses, like, for example, influenza or HIV. They, it mutates less. It, over the millions of years that it has evolved, it doesn't mutate that much. So I would hope, for the sake of humanity, that this virus doesn't continue what it's been doing for the million years even further. So if it doesn't mutate much, I don't. the probability that it will mutate away from the vaccine is low. Uh, the, and that's one reason, I will say. The second is... There are 11 clades that, that have been uh, reported uh, of the mutations right now. There are many, many sequences that are sequenced, but they seem to be falling in these 11 clades, which are 11 families of different sequences. And But I, I have not heard about any of them using a different entry process. They still use the ACE2 and TMPMP RSS2 uh, pathway to enter. So as long as the mutations result use that pathway of um, entry and we use spike protein to induce vaccines against that pathway the vaccine should work against the multiple strains uh, bharat i think uh, there are some questions pouring in there can you ask the questions which have come recently yeah yeah uh, there is a question from anju in a panel uh, anju can you ask a question yes yes please Hi, Anju. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, there's um, there's growing evidence that the vaccine doesn't. Um, I'm sorry, in uh, recovered patients, that the protection is not uh, very long-lasting. IgG levels fall after 60 days or or so. 
So wouldn't that be expected also from the vaccine? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'll answer it. Um, I, I didn't have... Uh, uh, was there a follow-up on that? Okay. Um, so uh, I'll answer it in uh, multiple ways. Anju, you know, you, since you, you, are, you and I have been talking about immunology for many, many months now, yeah. um, this virus is interesting. It seems to inhibit, it induces this massive cytokine storm, but in the absence of interferon. Right. So which is a very, very unusual kind of a, a cytokine storm. So I don't know what the role of that inter lack of interferon has mm -hmm. in terms of uh, inducing, uh, helping B cells, you know, undergo long term. That is one possibility. We don't know exactly the mechanism. Then the second is, um, it is possible, this, this is absolutely hypothetical, that memory B cells may upregulate ACE receptor and may, may be susceptible to the virus yeah. That is another possibility. Mm -hmm. And there are many other possibilities. But but the fact is that some people, uh, are, are some reports are showing that it is a transient response is a little worrisome from a pathological perspective. Um, but I don't, I'm not so worried yet about it because uh, even if the IgG response is reducing, um, the amount that is required for protection against infection might still be much lower because right. of other vac viruses that, you know, like for hepatitis B, uh, the when you get vaccinated, you get 10,000 units or even 1 million units of, vac of antibody against these va vaccines, but the protective level is only 10. Mm. So, um, so, you know, it, it, as long as it doesn't go down below the protective level, uh, I won't be so worried about it. Uh, and, and to follow up your question, I think the vaccine will work differently because the vaccine doesn't have these other viral proteins which which can interfere with the immune system. Right. There is there is some uh, trial going on also, I think, with interferon beta. Yes. Yes. So, so interferon alpha mm -hmm. and beta are affected. I am not sure about gamma yet. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, uh, sir, I have a couple of questions from uh, uh, participants. Uh, first question I would like to take is, uh, few scientists have confirmed that COVID may be airborne. How would you explain whether it is a airborne or not? Yeah, so uh, interestingly, a lot of people have been reporting um, that it is airborne. Again, my reading is based on, I have not seen a single air, uh, patient. So my uh, questions, the answers are going to be based on what I'm reading. And I, if I can uh, share my slide, I have a slide to show that. There was a very, very nice paper written by, uh, written by, um, uh, one second, uh, in, in the New Yorker, uh, uh, written by Atul Gabande. And if I can share my slide, my computer is not working. Uh, um, I, uh, it, it is so. What, what it is is the short answer. Sorry, is that um, it is not airborne. Uh, very very small particles of the virus are uh, are, are transmitted, and um, and and that's what I think causes the uh, airborneness. So if you can see my slide, uh, I'm going to play this. Uh, this is this is from Atul Gawande's paper in New York and uh, in New York in the New Yorker. I would highly recommend reading this paper for those who are interested in uh, in this uh, question. What makes the virus so dangerous? Uh, and you can see this video. Can you see this video? Yeah. Uh, so this is this this is published in New Yorker. Uh, you can see that uh, if you are if you are if you are mildly infected then you're transmitting the virus, you know, at a very short range and you have very, very small micro particles. But if you're highly infected, you can see how many particles and how far the particles are going. So this is a very vivid image of what is happening to, a, to an infected patient. So it is not airborne, but it is present in these very, very small, tiny particles, uh, very, very small uh, particles. Yeah. So I'll stop sharing again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I hope uh, you answered the question. Uh, and this next question is, there are different approaches to uh, this vaccine development, uh, DNA, RNA, attenuated uh, uh, pathogens, and which is going to be your favorite? 
<laughs> Good question. My favorite by far is going to be the live attenuated vaccine. That is the one that is going to be ultimately required for this, this, this disease, I believe. And I'll stick my neck out by saying that. The reason I say it is that this, the immune response to this virus is very, very complex. It's not a, um, it, it's not a simple virus. It, it is interfering with many components of our immune system. So even like I showed you with this virus, uh, like I showed you with the Chadox vaccine in the monkeys, when they were challenged, um, the, it did not result in a sterilizing immunity. You did get the vaccinated monkeys did get the virus and there was enough virus in the mucosal tissue. So for a vaccine, for a real vaccine to work in a very, very large population of people, you need a very robust immune response. Uh, and while primitive, uh, meaning primitive, meaning uh, if, uh, our, our uh, measles, mums, rubella vaccines, or even chickenpox vaccine, older chickenpox vaccines, and other vaccines that we've got for decades and decades were made in a very crude way, uh, and they and they have they are the full virus, except they miss miss some components. When you use all the components of the virus, you will generate a much more robust immune response which should be much more protective than these um, sophisticated proteins. While the sophisticated mRNA and the Chadox vaccine may be good for the short term, which are absolutely required and, and develop very, very systematically, um, I think for the ultimate goal will be uh, live attenuated, I believe. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. And uh, next question is, uh, can... Uh, BCG vaccine helps to fight against COVID-19? If as how? Yeah, so good question again. Uh, again, I have a slide for that and I will, it's much easier for me to explain it in a slide. So I will share my slide again. Um, and and uh, the, it is not necessarily the BCG vaccine itself. Uh, it is it is the nature of the innate immune response, and I have to look for that slide. Um, so um, so one one question, uh, uh, one, one, this is a related question. For example, is uh, why are why are certain people? Uh, I'm going to answer that question in this way. So why are certain people more susceptible to it than others? It sort of relates to the BCG question. I'll come to that. The potential hypothesis is that the heightened overall innate immune response that we all have, uh, which is increased number of baseline um, innate cells or higher levels of interferon alpha and beta during, uh, uh, will result in a lower uh, viral load in the body. And if you have a lower viral load in the body, you will have a lower exhaustion of these uh, immune responses. Um, but then what happens is, if you have a higher innate immune response, um, uh, if you have a higher Im innate immune response, the, the um, viruses be, will be cleared a little bit faster. You will have an overall lower virus load and you will have less morbidity. So the theory about BCG vaccine is that the BCG vaccine may induce a higher level of innate immune response. And from the experiments I'm showing you here uh, are if you have a higher level of innate immune baseline innate immune response, um, you might have a better chance of responding to this vaccine immunologically a little bit better. So yeah, so that, that is the response. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Next question is, uh, can we repurpose anti-tuberculosis drugs against COVID-19? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know if anybody in the panel is able to answer that question because I'm not familiar with all the anti-tuberculosis drugs in the pathways of how it is used. But if there is a drug that blocks any of the viral replication pathways, yes. But I'm not familiar with the anti-tuberculosis drugs. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, Bharat, you yourself has uh, done some uh, in silico work on streptomycin. And, uh, you know, I think you can explain uh, what happens. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, yeah. There is nothing like we cannot repurpose any molecules or uh, particularly small molecules, uh, uh, which cannot be repurposed. Okay, well, we can uh, screen in silico or uh, in vitro if we have uh, enough uh, uh, evidences or investigations which are substantiable. 
uh, we can uh, screen them against uh, uh, possible drug targets for COVID-19. Okay. Thank you. And I think you would like to add that you did find uh, uh, RDRP inhibition by streptomycin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just about we, 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 we found. Yeah, we found a couple of anti-TB molecules which were identified as the potential inhibitors of spike lycoprotein, RDRP, and a couple of proteases like 3CL Pro. Very nice. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I would like to take the next question, sir. Uh, yeah. How co-vaccine is different from Oxford University vaccine? Uh... I been uh, Oxford uh, University is is the is the adenoviral vector. Which other uh -huh. vaccine are you talking about? Covaxin. Oh, Covaxin. Co is that the Bharat? Um, yes. Yeah, Bharat Biotech. Yeah. yeah, remind me what is the platform? I, I I don't remember exactly what the platform is. Is it a protein or is it an adenovirus? Uh, no. It's peptide based, sir. It's peptide based. Okay. Okay, if it is a peptide base, I can give you a general impression of what how it is different. Um, generally, uh, adenoviral vector vaccines are used because um, when you when you use an adenoviral vector, which is a live virus, uh, at least it has a few replication, it can uh, undergo a little bit of replication and expression. Uh, you can activate both the cell mediated as well as the humoral immune response very very robustly, and because it is a virus. Uh, adenovirus, uh, you 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 cause this initial inflammatory response that is required for inducing a strong innate uh, strong immune response. You get the early innate immune response with this with this virus. You also get um, uh, cytotoxic T cell activation. You also get B cell activation, which is the the CD4 cell activation. So the adenovirus does that. Peptide vaccines are also very useful vaccines. They're definitely inducing immune immune responses. But if you use peptides in the absence of, uh, I don't know what the Bharat vaccine's adjuvant is, for example. But if you don't have an, if you don't have a very effective adjuvant, you will get a much suppressed uh, innate immune response compared to the adenoviral vector uh, innate immune response because you don't have those components to induce innate immunity. Peptides will induce very good CD4 positive T cell response, but it, they may not induce very good CD8 response because um, the CD8 T cell response needs to be presented through the endogenous pathway. And the endogenous pathway generally is induced by activation, by expression of the protein inside the cell. So these peptides, unless they have a capacity to go inside the cell and be presenting MHC class 1 from inside the cells, they will not be. Uh, so if, if, you are, if you ask me, like, what is the probability that the peptide vaccine will induce a protective immune response? The answer is yes, it is definitely will induce some kind of a antibody response, which may be sufficient for this virus for, for protection. But the Chadox vaccine, which is the adenoviral vaccine, will be much higher. And the reason I say that the live viral vaccine will, will be the best, because the live viral vaccine will induce a response probably 10 times better than even the Chadox vaccine. But it's more difficult to manufacture. Uh, thank so, you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Other than viruses, are there any other interventions like adjuvants applied in COVID vaccine development? Yes, absolutely. Development of uh, adjuvants is a central component of um, of vaccine vaccine development. As I mentioned in the in the target product profile, one of, one of the last two items was that you want the immune response to last at least for a year, and you want the vaccine to be stable. Those two components are induced are elicited by adjuvants. So adjuvants, for example, can induce some kind of an inflammatory response, which will help the immune system. In like I said, the Bharat vaccine may have some adjuvant that induces that innate immune response. I'm not familiar with it, but I'm sure they have something like that. Uh, and then um, the the formulation will have to be such that the peptides or the vaccines that don't degrade. Uh, during transport through through you know thousands of miles across the world, uh, so so adjuvants play a very big role in um, in vaccination. Hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Thank you. Hydroxychloroquine yeah, yeah. is useful in COVID nineteen. Yeah. 
So, you know, for, for reasons beyond the control of society, the hydroxychloroquine has become a political issue rather than a scientific issue. Um, there are different schools of thought of how um, hydrochloroquine works. Now, I've heard doctors from Bombay, uh, all the major physicians from Bombay who are using hydrochloroquine um, very frequently for themselves, even prophylactically. Um, uh, and, and we in India have been using uh, hydrochloroquine against for prevention of malaria for maybe decades, right? So, um, so we are familiar with the, our clinicians are very familiar with the use of hydrochloroquine for these kind of diseases. And, and from a mechanistic perspective, Bharat, um, hydrochloroquine seems to be, it has, a, it has multiple roles. It's an old drug and it has multiple, multiple mechanism of actions. But for this virus, the, maybe the most relevant mechanism of action may be that it, it, it is high enough dose in the uh, intracellular organelles in like where either in either in assembly, um, like the lysosomes, it, it might be it should be present at high enough concentrations in those to prevent the rep viral replication cycle. So if that is the case, uh, if, it, if it has to be used as a drug, then you need probably very high concentrations of, of hydrochloroquine. To, and that may be very difficult to achieve through an oral infection, reaching high enough concentrations in the lung and inside the cell. And the high concentration will obviously have some side effects. But maybe as a preventive, uh, if, if it is used as a lower dose, uh, maybe it is effective. And that's probably why uh, some of the physicians that I know of uh, are recommending that in India. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, Thank please. you, sir. Uh, from previous experience, how much of immune response testing in blood is likely to reflect in real life situation? Uh, uh, I, I know you, you may not know the answer to the question, but I'm assuming that the how much of immune response to the vaccine is required for uh, resulting in protection. Uh, yeah. If that is the question, then I would say um, like, for example, I'll just give you some numbers. I told you hepatitis B, we know that the protective level is around 10 units, 10, 10 international units, is we, we know that. And the reason we know that is that a very, very large clinical trial has been done with hepatitis B, where they've looked at people who got the vaccine, but then got infected. And, and those, people who get in, uh, those people who get infected despite having the vaccine had an antibody title less than 10 units. That's how you could establish the protective level of the vaccine. So it takes decades to determine the level of antibody that is required for protection against a particular disease. But if, if I have to uh, sort of summarize from uh, at least 20, 30 vaccines that I've been work, working with for the last several years, I would, I would think that, the, that you, would, you should develop an antibody response that is in the range of one microgram per ml of neutralizing antibody that should be protective. If I, had, if, if I had to extrapolate from all the previous data, one microgram per ml is approximately where, where you should reach. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is, uh, could airway delivery of vaccine be an option here? Not only an option, I think it will be required. I think I think this a, a nasal uh, because a nasal uh, protecting the upper respiratory tract is probably a very primary importance to uh, for this vaccine. And, and I think, um, um, you know, a live attenuated vaccine given intranasally will be the ultimate for this vaccine because, you know, you have to protect the upper respiratory tract. And as we've seen from this vaccine, at least in the monkey study, um, when, when we in, give it intramuscularly, you're probably not generating a high enough antibody in the upper respiratory tract. Please. Yes, Next question is, does people suffering from autoimmune disorders respond well than an ordinary person? I mean, healthy person. Yeah. Um, what is known from this disease and the, and the epidemiology of this disease is that people with any kind of comorbidity, whether it is autoimmune disease or whether it is diabetes or heart disease or anything else, uh, are not uh, are doing worse than people who are healthier. And there may be many reasons for it. Uh, and because you know, one simple reason could be these or these other diseases or, or other uh, comorbidities 
may simply upregulate the ACE receptor for various other reasons and then make more cells infectable. So that is one simple reason. But then um, there are, the immune response is extremely complicated, especially in autoimmune disease. Um, and and uh, the, the interplay between the different immune responses will result in a aberrant uh, vaccine-induced response or, or even a um, virus-induced response. So I would say if you have a comorbid disease, anything, uh, be careful, extra careful. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is, in what way a preventive medication can help to combat the virus at cellular level? What changes would it expect to bring about at our cellular level for a novel corona specifically? Okay. Um, I, I think um, from a preventive drug, uh, one drug that I, based on the immune response, I can only speak of the immune response, is if there is a drug um, that induces interferon alpha and beta levels, baseline and I think it will have an impact on um, severity of the disease. I think that's one thing I can think of. Uh, because what we know is that the virus, uh, when, when infected, affects these pathways. And if you preempt uh, the immune response or you prime the immune response such that these pathways are activated earlier, uh, then it is possible that it might have an impact on the severity of the disease. It will not prevent, but it might reduce the severity of the disease once you get it. The hypothesis. Okay. Uh, can immunomodulators uh, be an alternative for vaccine uh, to, to some extent? Uh, in, yes. I mean, if 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 you come, you mean if you combine immunomodulators with the vaccine, will you augment the immune response? Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, but I think you'll have to do it more strategically to understand which immunomodulator you use and how much antibody you want you to respond. For example, if there are some patients who are uh, comorbid and have a sort of lower level of overall immunity, if you want them to respond better to a vaccine, you might give them you might give the vaccine with some kind of an immunomodulator which enhances the immune response to the vaccine. That's an example I can think of. Okay, thank you, sir. Our next question is when this virus is more fatal in elderly who truly res uh, require a protection uh, with their immune response being very poor, do you think we will get an vaccine uh, which will protect elderly? Yeah, so so I that's a very, very insightful and very good question and actually the, one of the most important questions for society at large today. Okay. Will we be able to protect the elderly with anything, whether it is with drugs or prevention. Um, and yeah. it is it is a um, it is double edged sword, right? Because the, as you mentioned, the whole, the immune system as we grow older becomes a little weaker, so quote unquote weaker, uh, and the requirement of a vaccine is going to be higher. So uh, although I don't think it will be such a big issue because I think people uh, older people get other vaccines, like the pneumococcal vaccine is given after the age of 60, 65. There are other vaccines that um, people get. So it's, it's not like the older people have a very low immune response where they don't respond to anything. Um, it is just that uh, they have generally lower immune response than the younger people. But I think the vaccine should work in older people also. I don't see that as a problem. Thank you, sir. Next question is, can you please share your experience uh, uh, when the vaccine become a dangerous uh, thing? Uh, especially we have seen it in case of uh, HIV trial. Uh, why did it happen in HIV trial? So I'll give you uh, two examples of when the vaccine became dangerous. One is the HIV. For example, in HIV, the uh, vaccine that was used there was actually the adenovirus. It was the adenovirus expressing HIV um, gag pollen neph, which are viral um, HIV proteins that was given to patients who were uh, infected, uh, sorry, who were healthy subjects. And just like the Chadox vaccine, there was a group of people who was given a control vaccine and a group of people who were given the, the HIV vaccine, adenovirus expressing HIV gag pollen neph. And uh, they, it, just like this study, the study was unblinded. And when, let's say, about 100 people got infected, they tried to see how many of those were infected in which group. And exactly the result I showed you in that table, the number of people who got HIV were higher slightly higher 
than the pe patients who who were not who were not given the vaccine this this study is called the step trial step trial you can actually look at it on google and you can read about it uh, that the vaccine um, made the made the individuals susceptible to the to hiv more than the control vaccine and the immunological reason could be that the vaccine induced activation of hiv specific cd4 positive cells which is the reservoir for hiv so or and therefore you know that's one reason the second vaccine that was tried a, a couple of years ago now which was in with dengue and i i don't know the immunological basis of this but the but the fact is that children especially in i think it was in the philippines uh, when they did the study uh, the the children who got the uh, dengue vaccine uh, got more dengue than the the children who did not get the vaccine. So uh, the, there are many multiple mechanisms for that. But those are the two, vac two vaccines I can give you. Uh, real examples where vaccination resulted in making it more dangerous. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, how much will be the cost of adenovirus cargo? Can we afford it? I think there's no choice. I, mean, what, I think there has to be a negotiation between the manufacturer and the governments um, to, to make this uh, vaccine available if it is effective. Uh, and I'm sure philanthropy, governments, everybody else will come and the, and the industry at large itself uh, is going to make sure that if there's a successful vaccine, then uh, it will be available to everybody who needs it. Society has to work together. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, as we all know, COVID-19 has got a very low mortality rate. And uh, do you think really the vaccination is necessary for COVID-19? Absolutely required for vaccine. Absolutely required. Even though the mortality rate is low, it should be. You should actually think about. Um, I think this is a this is a message for all of us as we walk around in society, society, and and why the lockdown is important is what are we trying to do actually the whole purpose of the lockdown and uh, um and and social distancing is really to protect the elderly and the comorbid patients because we know that um, most of the majority of the younger and healthy population if they get infected uh, they will clear the virus some people may get a little bit more. It, it may take about six, six months for them to clear the virus. Some, most of them will clear it within one month, right? Now, um, for them, it's not a problem, right? But they will transmit it to their mothers, to their parents, to their grandparents. Now, grandparents and parents, older people, will now be highly susceptible to fatal part of the disease. So you can't just say that you know young people will not get the disease, so it's okay. They are the ones who are going to transmit it to the world of people. So that's why I think the vaccine will allow everybody to be protected. Thank you, sir. Next question is, how effective monoclonal antibodies are, like uh, itilizumab and uh, tocilizumab? Yeah, uh, so uh, from what I see from the published literature and clinical trials are still going on for, with some, for some of these. Um, the it seems to block the um, cytokine storm uh, and, and one of the uh, i told you in the pathogenesis of the disease that the virus has two mechanisms of action one is the virus induced pathology and the second is immune response mediated pathology and both italizumab as well as uh, tocilumab induces uh, suppresses the the cytokine storm and therefore might reduce some aspect of pathology and therefore that's the mechanism of action of how it works Thank you, sir. Sir, do you think uh, different ethnic groups respond differently to COVID virus or vaccine? Yeah, um, good question. Very good question. I don't think it is the ethnic groups per se, but I think it might be related to your genetic background. And so I'll give you examples. Uh, uh, I mean, we all know that MHC, your, the expression of your MHC molecules, or MHC genes uh, will, will decide, will demonstrate whether you have a strong immune response or a weak immune response. That's your genetics. The MHC genes are, uh, are uh, inherited from your parents. Uh, and depending on the nature of the MHC genes that you have, um, you will only uh, induce that kind of an immune response. So 
depending on which ethnicity you are, not necessarily ethnicity, but or race, but depending on the MHC background, that's the strength of the immune response that you have. The second, I would say from a genetic perspective, which I'm very interested in and curious, is that the nature of the genomic sequence of your gut microbacteria, also or gut bacteria, also seems to dictate of how, how strong an immune response you will generate. So those are the two genetic elements of that I know of. Thank you, sir. Um, next question is, what is a mode of administration you recommend as a stable uh, mode of uh, or route of administration for COVID-19 vaccine? So, you know, the most popular and most easy uh, uh, from a physical perspective is intramuscular. So just take a needle and inject it in the muscle. But but if it doesn't elicit the required protective immune response in the to protect against the lower and upper upper respiratory tract, then you, we will have to go with a with a more uh, more difficult way of uh, administering the vaccine, which is intranasal. But if that is required to protect, ultimately the route of administration should be um, you know it should be um, protective. Otherwise, what's the point of vaccination? Okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, there was a paper in JAMA uh, about uh, cytokine storm in hyper-exaggerated while only IL-6 had higher concentration. How do you opinion on it, sir? Um, so if I understand the question correctly, is it, um, is it uh, I think I've seen the paper, it is related to uh, higher IL-6 levels without the other cytokines. Is that the question? I think. Yeah. yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, uh, the, the the virus is a very interesting virus that I, I think it is it is I can speak specifically for the interferon alpha because or, or alpha and beta because I've been sort of reading some of the papers related to that. Um, there are five proteins of the virus which seem to interfere specifically with the interferon pathway, um, and uh, I have a slide that I, I could show that to you. But um, it interferes with uh, uh, Rig1 alpha, MDA1, and many other proteins like that. And Bharat, you might be doing some of those structural biology studies, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there are these five proteins that interfere with the pathway. There's also a protein which is called uh, ORF3A, which seems to be a decoy for the interferon receptor. So there are five, six proteins that specifically are attacking the interferon pathway. So there must be an evolutionary reason for it. Uh, and so by, by inhibiting that pathway, you know, the other pathways may be hyperactivated because you're seeing inhibition of one pathway. And, and you know, because interferon may, may have a role in cross-regulating IL-6, and therefore you see higher IL-6. Um, so that is one hand-waving uh, answer I would, I would like to give to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, and next question is, uh, how uh, if team uh, interferon-induced transmembrane proteins can contribute for uh, COVID infection or infection development? Yeah, so uh, interferon we know is a very, very strong cytokine that has a lot of antiviral activities, not just this virus, but many other viral activities. So, for example, the interferon response element can activate other, other genes which can then, other cytokines which can then kill, activate other immune cells that can kill the viral infected cells. That's one. Uh, interferon, and interferon induced activation of transcription factors can block uh, or bind to uh, viral genes and then and block viral gene expression. That is one second mechanism. And the interferon uh, activated systems can also activate uh, endonucleases, which can then digest the uh, viral uh, viral nucleotides. So there are many mechanisms evolutionarily that interferon has been has evolved from an immune system perspective to block viruses from um, from a biochemical and molecular biology perspective. It's it's antiviral activity. Now, if because of that, uh, the virus has probably evolved to block the interferon response to escape the immune system. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is to what extent immune response of vaccine differ in pre and post exposure to COVID-19? Yeah, so um, um, from my reading, I think from my understanding, the vaccine will work in, if, you're, if you're not infected. The vaccine may not have a huge impact on your uh, immune response if you're already infected because if you're already infected and if you clear the virus in in my opinion you should have a fairly reasonable immune response now if it turns out 
that it, it the, that epidemiological studies suggest that the antibody response is transient, as Anju had housed earlier. Um, then uh, a booster response with the vaccine uh, may be beneficial for those people. Thank you, sir. And uh, what is your uh, core advice to young scientists aspiring to be a vaccine scientist? Oh, nice. Very nice. I mean, it could be a better time for science. I mean, there are 25,000 papers published in three months on COVID. Go read them. Go read them. Learn how to read papers fast. It's a fantastic time. Find your mentors, find your peers, talk about the science, get interested in this, in this field. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a story, right? My, uh, my daughter, who's, who's, who, lives with, who lives here now, I live in her house now, um, she tells me, hey, dad, uh, when you did immunology in 1980s, did you ever know that, you know, immunology is going to become such a big thing in the next couple of decades? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't have planned it. You couldn't, you couldn't have planned that in 30 years from now, COVID would come and that you would be so important and everybody would call you for seminars or something. You couldn't have planned it. So, uh, the, and, and now she, she teaches yoga full time and she's, you know, she loves yoga. So, so, she, so I guess the message that I'm saying is follow your passion. You love science, follow it. Every, uh, you know, the, the universe will conspire to make you successful if you really do things passionately. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And the next question is, could an intradermal patch delivering a small molecule modulator of, say, uh, IL-6 be effective here? Uh, yes, it can be. I mean, I think we'll have to, you'll have to look at the pro, uh, pharmacokinetic uh, and pharmacodynamic um, profile. Uh, if um, because the cytokine storm is a very sudden and very large uh, burst of uh, cytokines. Uh, so for that, you probably need a, almost like an intravenous injection to be able to match the, the, um, the cytokine storm. But um, if, if, the, if the pathogenesis of the disease requires that the, that the cytokine response be subdued over a long period of time from a chronic response, then I think the patch would work. Thank you, sir. And uh, next question is, are there any vaccines so far uh, for any species of coronavirus in veterinary or human use? Well, from what I've read so far, there were um, uh, for, for MERS and SARS, uh, COVID-1, there were vaccines that were being developed, and I believe they had finished phase one at least, and they were pro proven to be safe. But because the the, the epidemic went away, uh, they were not to be, they could not be tested in a in a phase three trial because in a phase three trial, uh, to, to show efficacy, some people have to be infected with the virus. Otherwise, you know, you can't show efficacy. So because the number of people that were infected were very very low. The phase three could not be done, but I believe phase one and phase two data are available, and both of them showed uh, that they that at least they induced some level of protective antibody, just like the new ones are being inducing right now. And for thank veterinary, you, I'm not sure. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, do you think coronavirus is a storm which will come and go, or it's going to stay for a long time? You know, uh, the vaccine will have to be a component of its uh, elimination. Ultimately, it have to be all the, all uh, all the infectious diseases that we have survived that human race has survived against: measles, mumps, rubella, hepatitis A, hepatitis B. Were lethal viruses on eliminating large populations of people when there was no vaccine. When the vaccine came, you know, things became under control. And as uh, Dr. Shippen said in introduction, um, you know, there are two or three major things that have changed uh, society at large, you know, sanitation, uh, nutrition, and vaccines. And vaccines has to be a solution for this for this virus in the future. Do you think, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, do you think we are at least six months away from vaccine in India? At least, for sure. Uh, you know, uh, from a manufacturing perspective, um, you know, I think, um, um, Dr. Punawala from Serum Institute had actually announced that they would get few million doses by the end of the year, given given the scale at that they're planning. You know, million or two million is not going to be enough, even even for you know a few states in India. Um, but but I think the, by the end of the year, at least at least the most 
required people who need to be vaccinated, the healthcare workers, highly susceptible people should get the vaccine. I, I hope, you know, if everything goes smoothly. Thank you, sir. And uh, last question, I think. Uh, how about Ayurvedic or homeopathic drugs useful to treat COVID? You know, I am a very big uh, you, you, your this um, Rishikesh, you and uh, Anju. All of my conversations with you in the last six months have really, really enlightened me about the role of Ayurveda in uh, in medicine at large. And I believe it is it is such a important element of 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 medicine. Um, it has thousands and thousands of years and thousands and thousands of molecules that have demonstrated very, very high efficacy. I think I think what you are doing in Atrimid is really, really the important part, which is taking the literature, literature meaning your uh, Vedic literature, uh, validating some of that with the molecules through molecular computational work that you're doing, and then testing it in a clinical trial setting and demonstrating that these molecules work the, the, actually, the, the fact that these work, molecules work has already been demonstrated. We just need to prove it scientifically today. And if we if we do that, I think it will revolutionize uh, medicine. Thank you, sir. And uh, I have one more question. Uh, is there something good happened because of Corona immunologically? <laughs> well, <laughs> that is a very interesting question. I mean, I'm loving it. I'm sorry to say because I'm learning so much every day. <laughs> it, immunology for me, it has been fascinating. I mean, I never knew about the interferon signaling pathway as much as I do in the last six months. <laughs> but, but you know, seriously. But I think it's it's a very very dangerous disease. Let's not underestimate, uh, you know, its potential of of really you know, having very profound effects on especially older and uh, comorbid people. Let's keep them safe, wear your masks. It's a very simple way of protecting uh, each other. Uh, don't worry about, pr protect yourself, but protect yourself, not, not just for yourself, but for your parents, for your grandparents, protect yourself so that they don't get infected. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for taking our questions patiently and over to Dr. Damle, sir. Uh, thank you, Narin Saab. It was wonderful. Um, uh, many panelists were quiet because probably, probably because uh, there were questions getting fired uh, from audience. Uh, is there something I we can um, uh, hear from each one of you, Dr. Manoj, or uh, is uh, Madhavan Kuti sir is still here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, can can we uh, get him to say something? I think uh, uh, I think he has left. He has left. Okay. Uh, any anybody else? Uh, Shaiju, Muhammad, uh, Dr. Sadat, Dr. Rija, uh, Dr. Lata. Yeah, Dr. Uday Kumar. Yeah, Uday Kumar, please. Yes, doctor. Yes. Shall I? Shall I ask? Yes, please. Yeah, sir. This. Uh, if, uh, this immunomodulatory drugs, when we consider, uh, sir, uh, sir, do you think that uh, these uh, immunomodulatory drugs are getting equally important in research aspect at this present scenario? Uh, because we think that it will be effective as an adjuvant and sometimes will be more effective in case of comorbidity or uh, uh, when there is a lymphocyte depletion in most of the reported cases. We think immunomodulatory drugs have a lot of advantage. So do you think that uh, now in the world uh, these immunomodulatory drugs are getting proper attention in the, uh, in the research aspects? Yes, I think a very, very good question. The immunomodulatory drugs right now um, are, um, uh, there are a lot of immunomodulatory drugs that are being approved for um, various kinds of, especially autoimmune diseases. And, and the role of uh, immune modulation in pathogenesis of various diseases is really just now starting to be understood really clearly. Uh, because we understand, we're understanding immunology and the interactions of immunology better. The better we understand how the immunomodulatory drugs act at a molecular level, the better drugs we will make. And the reason I say that, by definition, 
the immune response, if, 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 if you try to immune modulate uh, something on this side, something else will suppress. And then if you try to suppress this, this other thing goes up. So the balance of the yin and yang of the immune response has to be very carefully monitored with these immunomodulatory molecules. And that's the challenge in developing the ideal immunomodulator, which can inhibit one side a little bit better, yet not make the other side worse. That, it's a balance that the, the research requires that balance understanding. Sure. Uh, Dr. Uday Kumar. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, this talk was very enlightening to us. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for this uh, enlightening talk. My question is, uh, sir, anyhow, we are waiting for a very successful vaccine. For the time being, can we uh, depend upon any type of these kind of immunomodulators to prevent uh, this infection uh, from corona? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm looking forward to uh, maybe talking to all of you later on. Um, but there are many, many um, molecules that have the potential of looking, of modulating the immune response, especially in older individuals. So that, like I mentioned, uh, increasing the innate immune response by you know, giving drugs that can augment, let's say, the number of NKT cells or NK cells or gamma delta cells or um, or the level of interferon secretion that are going on, um, if you can increase that baseline, the likelihood that they will get severe disease is lower. This is what the data is suggesting. Now, if you can find drugs that can induce that, it might help in, uh, in, in, the, in, in some of these uh, disease cases. That's one hypothesis that I, I think that can be tested. Okay, thank you, sir. Dr. Sadat? Hello. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I just didn't know that the wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for that. And also, especially uh, the Damdeji, also, because the cooperation and uh, this idea, this uh, one hour talk for uh, from the geniuses. And uh, we thank you so much for the organization also uh, for arranging this program. And especially for Shirumalaji, this is a wonderful, wonderful, it's a great presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Dr. Shiban, would you like to come in, please? Dr. Shiban, are you there? Yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shirmali. As I mentioned earlier, it was a wonderful presentation, enlightening, and the questions were equally intense and good. The audience participation was awesome. I hope in future also we'll have similar seminars with equal intense audience participation. I did not expect this kind of audience participation. Though 30% question, 30% questions I noticed was from Dr. Damle, but the rest 70% were really intelligent and people have great insight into how immunology and coronavirus works. Thank you very much to all the panelists and to Dr. Jarmali, you too. Look forward to meeting you again. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Now, I think um, to uh, end it, uh, uh, Dr. Manoj Kalur, uh, who is our associate, who is also part of our research. Uh, I, I forgot to introduce you to him, uh, Dr. Chirpale Saab, earlier. So he will uh, uh, render the word of thanks. Thank you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, respected uh, Chirpale ji and uh, respected uh, Shibanji and Dollars. Actually, it was really an excellent program as such, and the presentation was really went up well. The thing is that uh, Sir has covered from uh, a basic immunopathogenesis to viral entry and uh, the target product profile and uh, about the type of vaccine and uh, and even the role of all of all the questions has been answered and it was really wonderful. And on behalf of Ayurveda Medical Association of India. Uh, Atrimat Pharmaceuticals and Ayurveda Vilasi Vajishala, I really render, we are really enlightened by your speech, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I also thank uh, our uh, Atrimat chairman and our honorable uh, Shibanji for his uh, 
for for his initial talk about the vaccines and i thank shivanji as well thank you sir and i thank uh, dr sadat dinagar secretary dr rishikesh damle dr bg uday kumar dr lata damle dr raj thomas dr shaiju uh, bharat anju and all the organizing committee members and all the people who have been part of this and we are only this is only a start and we will be seeing more of this and this and i think this will give a good insight to all the participants who have been the part of this and thank you one and all thank you sir thank you thank you thank you so we will be back again after 15 days chirmale sir i will inform you probably you can also participate i will, I will definitely uh, participate yeah sure thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, let's call it a day bye 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 is a small announcement there is a small announcement uh, participants are requested to submit their valuable feedback through the link provided and you can even find the link shared in youtube chat box and you can receive the certificate only after submitting the feedback thank you very much